You're listening to the National Oceanography Center's Into the Blue podcast, where we tackle some of the biggest questions facing our ocean today by speaking to experts and voices from the world of oceanography. Hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, I'm Dr. Zoe Jacobs, and today I'm joined by Dr. Katia Popova to talk about the concept of socio-oceanography and the impact of NOx research on society. Hello, Katia. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Absolutely. So um, before we start, I'm going to ask you a random ocean question to break the ice. Um, So yours is, what is your favourite ocean and why? Oh, well, that's an easy one for me. Uh, For me, it's absolutely, obviously, Indian Ocean. (laughs) Um, Arguably least exploited mm-hmm. and least explored, especially its Western Indian part, mm. kind of facing Africa. Um, people usually talk about its incredible biodiversity, mm. and that's of course true, but what I find most mesmerizing about Indian Ocean is dynamical systems. So uh, it's northern part influenced by reversible monsoonal winds, so mm. its ocean currents also reversing. Well, how cool is that if your ocean current change direction twice a year? Well, and because the currents are reversible, it's a prevailing system, really, really bizarre. I mean, it, they have really amazing dynamics and and they're not staying still, they're moving around. And what's really interesting, I find, is their coastal communities. The efficient practices and traditions are so tightly linked to this monsoonal variability, reversals of the currents, and really strange dynamic of upwelling systems. So to a point, uh, it was the Indian Ocean which brought me to social oceanography. That is true. I agree. I think the Indian Ocean is also my favourite. I really like working there. I also quite like going there as well. (laughs) Um, So can you start by telling us a bit about uh, your background and how um, you became an oceanographer? Uh, Sure. So uh, I was going to become an oceanographer from my early childhood. I would love to say I decided to become a oceanographer because I loved mass and physics, but that wouldn't be true because I decided to go there even before I was properly introduced yeah. to mass and physics. So um, I was just reading too many adventure stories in my <laughs> childhood, you know, like Treasure Island or Jules Verne with Captain at 15 and yeah. In Search of Castaways. <laughs> so, and I thought the best way kind of to bring this to reality of my life is to go and be a seagoing physical oceanographer. But, uh, and I went to university to do physical oceanography, but then I got a bit seduced by love of mathematics and mm. also, and the influence of a science fiction book. So it was um, Isaac Asimov von Foundation uh, series. Uh, if you know it, it's about modeling of human society. So, but I was already on a path to do kind of almost uh, seagoing oceanography. So I took the second best modeling marine ecosystems rather than human society. So and tried to merge them. Cool. And then I came to NOC and has been doing have been doing uh, ocean modeling for twenty five years. Wow. Um, so what actually is your role at NOC? What kind of- kind of topics have you worked on? So yes, I'm uh, an ocean and ecosystem modeler and I lead a team uh, which is called Biogeochemical Modeling and Impacts. Okay, so quite physical science topics. Physical science topics. Yes, as in compared to like social sciences, human society. Oh, right. Yes, sure. Yes. Uh, but we're bringing social oceanography uh, exactly. here. So, yes. Exactly. Um, so, social oceanography then. What is it? So, social oceanography. Right. It's an emergent area of research uh, which takes a system look at marine environment. Mm-hmm. So, it brings both natural and social science perspective on the table. And it addresses challenges which needs advancement like of both sides, natural and social. So those challenges don't belong to either side mm. and it's advancement of both in collaboration. Right, I see. So is it different from socio-ecology? Because I've definitely heard of that before. Yes, indeed. So social ecology was uh, around for a while. Uh, 
it was even a Nobel Prize given for it mm-hmm. in 2009. But as follows from its title, it puts ecosystems, so living components at the center. But here at National Oceanography Center, our remit is so much broader than marine ecosystem. We do mm-hmm. lots of interesting research in marine ecosystem, mm-hmm. but we also yeah. do quite a lot of abiotic components. So for us, social ecology would have been a very narrow field. Right, so that's why we need to bring a much broader topic mm. of social oceanography which is inclusive for social ecology yeah absolutely so i mean as, as we said the impact of marine ecosystems is important for society um but we do lots of other cool research here at knock um can you give us a few examples of recent or ongoing studies that encompass social oceanography yeah sure well let's start with those which work with abiotic components okay. right so uh my first example is uh related to fast retreat of Arctic sea ice mm-hmm. in the last few decades. So usually we look at it from kind of oceanographic and climate science perspective, mm. but we had a really cool study led by uh, Evgeny Aksonov from National Oceanography Center looking at what risks and opportunities a retreat of Arctic sea ice brings to uh, Arctic shipping because Arctic sea routes are opening with this retreat. Cool. So, that's one example. Uh, my another example, quite recent study led by my Claire and Izier uh, with uh, Hankatonga volcano eruption. Yep. So it's a kind of area of geohazards, but they took it further towards kind of societal impacts mm. because that eruption cut the only telecommunication cable leading to the islands. So mm. the whole country was left without internet for more than a month. Hey, wow. So, yes, that's another example yeah. of um, social oceanography. And another example, probably my favorite, relates to marine robotics. Mm-hmm. So when we were launching marine robotics and marine gliders in Tanzania, before actually putting anything to the water, um, our robotics team, together with African sociocultural anthropologists, okay. were, I even have to look <laughs> at my cheat sheet, uh, we're running a study with local fishing communities who mm-hmm. never heard or seen marine glider. So mm-hmm. what they were trying to establish is what they would think if this yellow submarine resurfaced near the fishing nets. And what sort of kind of uh, information campaign we need to run with this community so there is a kind of no unwelcome kind of reception of this robotics happening. Right, I see. Gosh, that's like, that's three very cool examples, but all all completely different. We're looking at opportunities as well as just negative impacts. I mean, that's definitely worth mentioning. Um, and also getting involved with coastal communities. I really like that. Like the people, the real yes. kind of societal um, impacts. Cool. Um, but we do do a lot of research um, involving marine ecosystems though, don't we? So, um, do you have some examples of this kind of work? Um, I guess more along the lines of that socio-ecology that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, sure. So one kind of very novel for National Oceanography Center is a study being led by uh, our own uh, marine economist, Sarah Taylor, mm-hmm. on looking at seagrasses and the assessment as marine natural capital mm-hmm. and the inclusion into the national capital accounting. Mm-hmm. So that's a really cool study bringing together kind of more our natural environment outlook on seagrasses, but also economics okay. and also social science in estimating their cultural value and also finance all in one kind of single package. Mm, cool. So that's one. And my last one is my favorite and probably your favorite as well, Zoe, okay. <laughs> because it's ocean upwelling systems. Yes. So traditionally, we're kind of at the National Oceanography Center. We have been uh, looking for them for many years, mm. looking at like physical mechanisms and uh, biogeochemical consequences of increased primary production. But what we were doing with you for past five, six years in the Indian Ocean is looking at much kind of a whole system approach to upwelling uh, 
areas and at cultural kind of uh, traditions mm -hmm. and practices and industries which are dependent on this upwelling system and what the response of this cultures, tradition and supply chain are going to be if these upwelling systems start behaving themselves not the way they usually do. Yeah. And that's kind of bringing uh, risk management, uh, supply chains, and we do all remember all those newspapers in Kenya, for example, when there was a nobly strong upwelling, yeah. tons of tuna fish rotten on the beaches and all collapse of supply chains. Yeah, that was that was really interesting, actually, because normally we look at kind of a collapse of an upwelling system, negative impacts on the fishing industry. But actually, the upwelling was super strong and it kind of all spiraled out of control and mm -hmm. all the prices dropped and everything. Um, cool. Some really nice examples <laughs> there. Um, I'm sure there are lots more to come as well out of Knock soon. Um, Am I right in thinking that I've heard of socio-meteorology as well? Oh, yes, yes. We're not the only um, kind of a center which trying to move into more interdisciplinary mm. areas. So there is socio-meteorology uh, being studied and UK Met Office. So okay. what they're looking is at how different individuals uh, with different behaviors uh, process information to make their decisions, especially when it goes into severe weather warnings. So they're looking at behavioral aspects and various biases. So okay. yes, definitely, that's a group we would uh, love to uh, make close collaboration with. Yes. Yeah, so it's a really good time that we're developing this idea of social oceanography. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, actually, what was the motivation behind it at NOC? Because I know you are the main driving force behind it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, here at the National Oceanography Centre, yeah. we were trying for many years to do interdisciplinary studies mm -hmm. with various degrees of success. But the challenges marine environment is facing right now, climate change, mm -hmm. adaptation, mitigation, impact, sustainable development, mm -hmm. all this is making this interdisciplinary research pretty urgent and kind of 20 of us at the National Oceanography Center with interest in interdisciplinary studies mm. got together and decided that we kind of really need to develop a coherent way forward. Mm. So we uh, scoped social oceanography uh, and wrote a position paper in Journal of Marine Frontiers. Mm and develop a strategy how to go ahead with this and how to bring it kind of more and more into everything we do at the National Oceanography Centre. Yeah. I mean, congratulations on that paper. That was published very recently, which is a huge step for social Thank oceanography. Thank you. And <laughs> congratulations to you as a co-author on it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Little plug there. <laughs> um, so... What are the most interesting challenges on the horizon at NOC? Um, what do you see as being the next big thing or things? Right. Well, really a lot of them. And But I'm going to give you a slightly biased okay. answer. Uh, <laughs> I will list two which are more kind of my favourite given my ocean modelling background. So one is modelling carbon dioxide removal techniques. Mm -hmm. Well, nothing new. We have been doing it for past 20 years. Yeah. But what we really want to move to is to bring kind of socio-economic aspects into it. Okay. Unintended consequences, mm. kind of uh, geopolitical consequences, which can, can come from notions that nothing in the ocean is sitting still. Yeah. Everything moving around and there are transboundary issues bringing all sorts of frictions. Mm. So economic costs of these techniques, legal implications, mm. uh, social acceptability. So taking a kind of like a whole look at these techniques, mm. that's where I think we really, really need to move and we're okay. beginning to kind of study this direction. Yeah. So that's one. And another Another one, bringing a digital human into environmental digital twins. Ooh. So there was a podcast here with John Sidorn on was? environmental digital twins. Yes. Indeed. So I think from social oceanographic perspective, we really need to bring socioeconomic data and socioeconomic impact models into this. So that is kind of like a digital human environment to make it much more relevant to decision making. Mm. So that's my second favorite challenge. Ooh, they both sound very interesting. I'm sure there's lots of people interested <laughs> here at NOC especially. Um, so 
the first socio-oceanography workshop was held um, in March this year, wasn't it? Um, was it a success? Indeed, yes, that was a great workshop. So um, the format was very unusual and we liked it and we will mm. take it forward. So this workshop had four topics yep. and each topic was led by one natural and one social scientist. Mm -hmm. And the group discussing each topics was also equally split between natural and social scientists. So it was a very kind of interesting dynamic bringing so different many different yeah. disciplines together and trying to kind of develop common language and align the research tools and mm. try to come with something which is worth more than some of its parts. So yeah, that was great. And also to mention that each group were focusing on a specific kind of outcome. Okay. So we ended up, one of the groups ended up with uh, opinion paper in Nature Communications. So there are two papers in draft form. So Amazing. all incredibly productive. So we're going to repeat it in 2024. So watch the space. Cool. So the plan is to have uh, this workshop every year, is it? Yes. Yeah. And each year new topics well uh, some of them are repeat because they're interested uh, ever evolving ever developing of course uh, yeah but some are new yes like uh, this year we one of the new topics is um, digital human and digital twin we would okay. like to uh, try to address cool so, Cool. I was going to say, can you give us a little sneak peek on some of the topics that are going to be coming up? Well, another one I would like to introduce led by you, Zoe, and that's on <laughs> uh, socioeconomic impact of marine heat waves, it risks is. and opportunities. It is. Um, I hope you're looking forward to it. I'm very excited for that. Um, we actually did a podcast a few weeks ago on marine heat waves, so very topical at the moment. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so... There is also a website, isn't there? Yes, indeed. We have a flashy new website, indeed. which has uh, all the information about topics and uh, watch the space for information on the workshop, we, which we're just working on. Amazing. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us today. I've really enjoyed um, talking to you. I love the idea of socio-oceanography, as you know, um, <laughs> and I can't wait to see how it develops at NOC. Well, thank you. Thanks. If you're enjoying Into the Blue, please make sure you follow us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on future episodes. New episodes are released every other Wednesday on all major platforms and are also available to watch on the NOC's YouTube. See you next time.